Good morning. My name is Charlene Montgomery. I'm a worship associate, and I will be aiding uh, Martha Melkowitz, who is in charge of the service today. So welcome. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Buffalo. We are blessed to be here together, and we acknowledge that the land upon which we meet rests on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee people, original nations of this land, who continue to call for justice and self-determination. There is an exhibit at the Buffalo History Museum to learn more about our relationships to indigenous people. Just a couple of announcements. There are a couple of items from the fun and fellowship auction that you can still bid on. Check them out in your e-blast. And there is going to be a free online meditation course offered in September. All information for these announcements and lots of other good stuff is in your e-blast or the announcements found in your order of service. So now, let us worship. Come into this space to find a way into deeper spirituality so that when the world is challenging and threatening, we have a calm shore on which to stand. Come and share what we have learned with our children, not so that they may believe what we believe, but so they may understand their own value and find their place on the calm shore. Come and learn. Come and share. Come and worship. Please stand as you are willing and able to join us in the chalice lighting. We gather in loving community, inspiring one another to transform ourselves, to create a more just and compassionate world. Please join in hymn number 300 with heart and mind found in your gray hymnal. Good morning. This is a story of how Unitarian Universalism was formed. The story begins far, far away and a long time ago. Jesus lived and died. 
And the world went on, and what people thought kept changing. There was a lot of talk, conversations, discussions, agreements, and arguments. So many arguments that in the year 325, the ruler Constantine called religious leaders together to find answers to stop the arguing. One answer had to do with the nature of God. The leaders determined that God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost were all equally divine. They were a trinity. But other people felt strongly that God was the first and the foremost being. God was complete. He was one, not three in one. The unity. The people who did not believe in the Trinity were imprisoned, banished, and worst of all, burned at the stake. And the world went on, and what people thought kept changing. In 1568, King John Sigismund of, Trans Sigismund of Transylvania decreed that people in his kingdom could not be punished for what they believed or for what they taught. This idea, what we know as freedom of religion, was a brand new idea. And guess what? King John believed in the unity of God. And that's when Unitarianism became recognized as an official religion. Even with these new ideas, the challenges were not over for many years, and Unitarians were still persecuted. But the ideas of freedom of religion and Unitarianism never died. And the world went on, and what people thought kept changing. There came a time when some religious, de religious leaders declared that God would choose a small portion of people for heaven and doom the rest to eternal hell, no matter how they lived their life. This idea of predetermination did not go over well with the people who believed that God was a loving God. This idea that God was loving and we would make it to heaven became known as universal salvation. And the people who believed in universal salvation became known as universalists. The very first universalist church was founded in Massachusetts in 1774. Unitarianism started in Europe but by the year 1796, the first Unitarian church in the US was founded in Philadelphia. And the world went on, and what people thought kept changing. As the Unitarian church and the Universalist church began to talk more and more to one another, they saw similarities. Each was a free faith. Each was from the liberal tradition. Each did not have a creed and both encouraged lay-led ministry. There were differences. The Unitarians were concerned that those Universalists who emphasized spirituality, they were going to be too touchy-feely. <laughs> and the Universalists worried that those touchy-feely Unitarians who loved reason and science were too cold and stiff. But conversations continued. And in 1961, these two liberal churches joined together. The new church welcomes both reason and emotion, both science and spirituality. We are the better for it. Our story ends here for now. And the world goes on. And what people think keeps changing. Every week, our congregation takes a good portion of our Sunday morning offering <clears throat> excuse me, and gives it away to a social justice cause outside our church walls. This month, we are supporting the good work of the Tool Library. We have with us today Darren Cotton, who is the founder and board president of the Tool Library. Darren started the Tool Library as a grad student at UB and has continued to volunteer for the cause over the past 11 years. And here's Darren to tell us a little more 
about it. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, having us today uh, in this amazing church. This is the first time I have ever been here, so uh, really excited to see uh, so many people in such a beautiful space. Um, my name is Darren. I started the Tool Library back when I was a grad student, and what really compelled me uh, was living in a rundown apartment with an absentee landlord. Uh, so. Being a, a broke college student, I didn't have a ton of money for tools, but I did know that I wanted to fix up the place that I called home, uh, so I was able to cobble together some resources, long-term borrowing from my parents, as I like to say, um, but realized you know, as a, plan, uh, a student of urban planning that this was an issue that was not unique to me, that it was you know, something that people experience across the city and across Western New York. So that's really where the idea for the Tool Library was born, uh, to create a community-based space where people who wanted to fix up their homes, uh, start a garden, or organizations who wanted to improve their community could come gain access to the tools that they needed uh, without having to pay you know, a huge absorbent fund. Uh, so that's really what the Tool Library is dedicated to. Uh, so for as little as $20 a year, members can sign up. Uh, they borrow tools for a week. We've got an inventory of about 4,000 tools ranging anywhere from basic hand tools all the way up to lawnmowers, pressure washers, wheelbarrows, 20-foot um, ladders. Uh, and I will say one of our biggest challenges at the moment is that we have far surpassed the space that we are currently in. So we are looking for a new home. Uh, we are currently located right off of Main Street in University Heights. Uh, if anyone knows where Just Pizza is, we're right in that same building just around the corner. Um, but our goal really is to make tool access affordable. Uh, and one thing that I've realized especially over the pandemic in the past couple of years, is that it, it's so much more than that, that the Tool Library really is a platform for community change and for a way for us to collectively shift our values. So away from the idea that everyone has to own one of everything to the idea that as a community we can share resources and be better for it. So the thing that I love about the Tool Library is in addition to loaning out tools, we do things like tree plantings, we help build community gardens. Um, so again, imagining sort of what we can build together as a community. Um, and would love to talk to anyone who is interested in learning more, uh, our very first staff member. So we've been all volunteer for the past decade, which is crazy that we are now measuring uh, the length of time in decades, but that is how old we are. Um, we'll be in the, in the parish hall available to answer any questions. If anyone is interested in signing up, uh, we would certainly love to have you as a member um, and definitely stop on into the shop and find out what we can build together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Darren, that sounds wonderful, especially for a single person who has to take care of her own home and doesn't have all those tools, so that's great. You can use PayPal by going to our website, www.buffalouuu.org, and clicking on the blue Donate button. Or you can send a check by mail to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Buffalo, 695 Elmwood Ave, Buffalo, New York, 14222. If yours is a gift to our Share the Plate ministry, please write Share on the memo line, and it will be shared between the Tool Library and the church operating budget. If yours is a welcome gift to our congregation, please write Pledge 2022 on the memo line. Either way, please write UUCB on the important line and we will do the bookkeeping. Let's give from our hearts so we can transform the world.
Our reading this morning is an excerpt from The Big Idea, Do We Still Need Religion? by Robin Dunbar. It has often been claimed that religious belief arises from ignorance and superstition. If that were the case, you might expect religion to gradually fade away as societies become better educated and more scientifically oriented. There are at least two reasons, however, why religions persist. One is the fact that, on average, religious people are generally happier, healthier, and live longer. And for better or for worse, they also have easier deaths when the time comes. The other is that religious people are more likely to feel that they belong to a community. People who are part of a religious community were depressed less frequently, felt their lives were more worthwhile, were more engaged with their local community, and felt greater trust towards others. Religion's rituals, the standing, sitting, and kneeling in unison, the singing, the listening to emotionally rousing sermons, trigger the brain's endorphin system. Like opiates, endorphins produce a sense of bliss, bordering on ecstasy, calmness, and warmth, relaxation, and trust while elevating pain thresholds. Endorphins also underpin the bonding of friendships, and through that allow us to create supportive groups of like-minded individuals. The effect seems to be especially strong in the context of the religious rituals. It seems, therefore, that religions evolved to reinforce a sense of community cohesion something that's extremely important to our well-being and survival. But there is an aspect we humans possess, unlike other primates that lead us towards religion, and that is our ability to understand not only what someone else might think, but we can imagine what someone might think about what someone else might think. <laughs> This involves an ability to imagine several possible worlds at once. It's a short step from there to religious ideas, which in turn lead to better bonding, which makes you more likely to survive. The same cognitive abilities that give us religion also allow us to ask why the world has to be the way it is giving us science, and to imagine entirely fictional worlds, giving us literature. Thus, you could no more have a world where religion was cast aside as superstition than you could have one without science or stories. And that would be a very different world indeed. Let us join our hearts and minds in a quiet moment of prayer, reflection, and meditation. Spirit of life and love, mystery beyond all our naming, persist in guiding us to a quiet measure of this moment that we might link heart to heart in the stillness and calm leaving behind all scurrying and fury, rush and contempt for the shore of this quiet moment. We who gather together today, join together so that we might hold and celebrate with the joyful and hold the suffering and care for the mourning. We especially want to remember today Lori Hogan's son, David, who died suddenly last night after a short illness. Lori requests no phone calls at this time. 
Today we pray over those in our midst who struggle and appreciate those who have enough spirit to share. We pray in the names of all those known and unknown, present and absent, remembered and forgotten. And now let us fill this sanctuary with the names of all our loved ones, suffering in sorrow and celebrating in joy. Each name a breath, each breath a prayer. The breath of nature is upon us, the spirit of life is within us, and the community of love is among us. So be it, blessed be, and let the church say, Amen. Amen. Universalists. One of the foundations of what it means to be you is to find your own spiritual path. No dogmas to follow, no credos stating what we all believe. We do have our seven principles, and people who wish to find out about our church can read them and see if they feel comfortable joining in. I venture to say that all of us here agree with our seven principles. Our children learn about the principles from pre-K on. All of the ARC E classes are built around them. Here they are in their simplified form. Each person is important. Be kind in all you do. We are free to learn together and search for what is true. All people need a voice. Build a fair and peaceful world care for the earth. It is at age 12 and 13 that we begin to ask our children to take ownership. It is time for them to begin to know themselves and not just what we tell them. 
This past year, Doug Sherman, Beth White, Leslie Nickerson, and I worked with our 12 and 13-year-olds. We used the coming-of-age curriculum. There isn't time today to share with you, and I'm sure you're glad about that, all that's in the coming-of-age curriculum. I'll just touch on three topics. UU beliefs, UU theology, and UU spirituality. Let's begin with UU beliefs. We often hear, ah, you're a UU, you can believe anything. Well, throughout our history, we UUs have rejected dogmatic beliefs, but we are far from non-believers. We even share many beliefs, but we do not put our shared beliefs into a creed that we recite together. Deciding what we believe is personal and how those beliefs guide our lives is up to us. So we teach, what you truly believe will determine how you live your life, what you dev devote your life to, and how you will respond to life's challenges. How do we help ourselves define what we believe? We don't have a holy book to follow. Instead, we gather wisdom from many sources, other religions, humanist teachings, science, poetry, earth-centered teachings. And then there's the wisdom we learn from people who confront evil with justice, compassion, and love. And very importantly, we UUs know that there is wisdom that comes from our own experiences. All of these sources help us define our personal set of beliefs. So we teach our children to learn what you believe, search outside of yourself, and then search inside of yourself. Do you believe in angels, life after death, the power of prayer? Do you believe in destiny or fate? Do you believe in the power of an individual to affect change, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, the interdependent web of all on earth? What do you truly believe? We ask our 12 and 13 year olds to write it down. They have to write down what they believe to make their own credo. They don't really have to, but because they're good kids, they usually do what we ask. <laughs> if you come to the RA Sunday in May, you have heard each child share with us what they believe. That sharing is a special gift our children offer, and it takes courage. Our children know that stating what they believe is not easy. Their credos often include more of what they don't believe rather than what they do. We let them know that this credo is only a start and what they believe might change as they learn and grow. So we teach our children, discovering what you believe is a lifelong quest. Ask questions. The next topic is UU theology. To us UUs, theology is more than the study of God. But beliefs about God are certainly a part of it. We ask, what is your idea of God? Do you believe in God? Why? Or why not? What does that do for you? The curriculum points out that questions about the nature of God are often intertwined with questions about human nature. Talking about God leads to discussions about what helps us to be good and do the right thing. Are we born bad? Can we do something that is totally unforgivable? Why do bad things happen to good people? Our UU history provides directions for some of our answers to those challenging questions. Our universalist side gives us the idea of universalist salvation. There is always hope. Our Unitarian side opens the door to humanism, which says that humans can heal the world. And we teach our children, humans have an amazing potential for goodness. Believe in yourself. Our third topic is spirituality. We teach that some people feel that spirituality is a connection to the divine. Others say that that feeling we get is just a normal event in our brains. Either way, 
Spirituality does not require belief in a god or a particular spirit. There are tools which can help us move into a spiritual experience, yoga, meditation, jogging, journaling. We might experience spirituality when we feel that sense of oneness with nature, that sense of oneness with one another, or even some other. It might happen in a worship service. It might happen when we are by ourselves or with friends or being there when someone we love is dying. We can never predict when that moment of feeling one with something greater than ourselves will happen. So we teach, be open to that which is beyond what you know. So let's review. What do we teach our 12 and 13 year olds? Number one, what you truly believe will determine how you live your life, what you devote your life to, and how you will respond to life's challenges. Two, to learn what you believe, search outside of yourself, and then look inside of yourself. Three, discovering what you believe is a lifelong quest. Ask questions. Four, humans have an amazing potential for goodness. Believe in yourself. Five, be open for that which is beyond what you know. One larger lesson our children experience here is one of acceptance. They are allowed to question, and they do. They do not have to fit into a mold. They do not have to believe what any of us believe. Many of our children are able to find a place here where they feel seen, heard, and accepted. It is not easy to be a UU. We are not told how to be religious or spiritual. There are more questions than answers. But this religion is so special. We are free to define what religion, spirituality, and community means to each of us. And just as importantly, we are not limited by our view of God, nor our concept of what happens when we die, nor the interpretation of any one holy book. And we do have beliefs as you use. We believe in human ability, goodness, the search for truth, the interdependent web, justice, freedom of belief, and peace. We're just not going to make those into a creed to recite. Those of us who believe all of that come together here to form our community of love, growth, respect for one another, and hope. This religion, and even more to the point, this church, this community, we have a lot to offer each other in the world. As adults, we know this. Let's let our children learn it for themselves. Please stand as you are able and join in singing hymn number 301 in your gray hymnal.
chalice. As we extinguish the flame of this chalice, may we carry its light with us into the world in the power of peace, faith, justice, and love. We are all longing to go home to some place we have never been, a place half remembered and half envisioned we can only catch glimpses of from time to time. Community. Somewhere there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throats. Somewhere a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter. Voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. Community means strength that joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done. Arms to hold us when we falter. A circle of healing. A circle of friends. Some place where we can be free. May this space be that community for our children and for ourselves. And may we always remember we are not alone. We are never alone. <laughs>